Welcome to On Cloud, the podcast for cloud professionals, where we break down the state of cloud computing today and how you can unleash the power of cloud for your enterprise. Now, here's your host, David Linthicum. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. One of the things that's changed over the last five years is the way in which we value cloud. Right? It used to be very much CapEx versus OpEx, I even wrote about that in books I wrote. Um, and ways in which we look at cloud, that's not the metric that we're leveraging anymore. It's about agility, it's about the ability to decrease time to market, and it's also the ability to, in essence, make technology as a force multiplier for your business. So joining me today to discuss the changing role of cloud economics and where things are going, and also what we're doing specifically here at Deloitte, and we're going to have them introduce ourselves. JT? Yeah, thanks Dave. Uh, John Twardy here, partner in our strategy and analytics practice, so and I lead our sort of front end uh, where cloud meets business, and also one of our attribution tools, and we have many, which we call Cloud Value Calculator. We're going to talk about that. Andrew. Hey, uh, Dave, nice to be here. Uh, Andrew Adams, uh, lead uh, cloud for strategy, uh, and I'm also deeply involved in the Google uh, relationship as well. Okay, so to you, because I've seen you speak on cloud economics and, uh, and, and actually pretty good talks, or else I wouldn't have you on the show. So how is the change in the perception in the way we mechanically do the assessment of value of cloud computing you know, changed in the last five years and what have we done to really kind of adapt to those changes within yeah. the firm? Yeah, good question. So I think, I think the adoption or the change in the adoption is really follows the curve of sort of this conference and as you know, with cloud. Um, you know, the original value attribution frameworks were really quite technical. Right, a displacement of infrastructure. I have legacy data centers, legacy things. Right, I calculate the value of those, the depreciation of those. I move those on the books to expense potentially. And so, how do I, therefore, predict and project the value from a TCO perspective of that move to cloud? And so, it was sort of one directional, if you will. It had an infrastructure focus. Call that version one of cloud economics. Then, it's evolved since then, as I think our clients. Uh, have evolved, which they want to attribute value beyond just the technical aspects. They want to, how does that affect workforce transformation? How does that affect throughput and enterprise agility? How do you model those things? How does it model business value? If they're a transaction company, they do a lot of M&A or divestitures, could that help? How do I model that from an infrastructure? If I'm a product company, I release products faster, how does that happen? How do I attack new markets? And so as you can imagine, it gets a little softer in those concentric sort of rings of value from what I can see and touch, the infrastructure, to then how do people act and feel and, and work and what that does to talent models and potentially and how they're structured, a little more difficult. And then to all the way to value attribution, it's sort of predictive. And so that's really been the evolution and that's our uh, challenge and, and where we've been working with our clients to try to put some science around that art and sort of evolve them into the future. So Andrew, is there any kind of science that we can put behind that art? Yeah, well, there really is, because if you look at uh, how a company would grow, right? So customers, price, all of those levers you can pull, you can do them better, faster, cheaper, if you're actually on the cloud in a meaningful way. So in other words, you can't just do it a little bit and have some of the data, but not all of it, or not you know, the right parts of your company, your client relationships. Once you get all of that onto the cloud, you start running the right analytics, you really can develop new offers, bring them to the market more quickly. Um, and I think that stuff is more attributable if you can actually see it and plan it out. Yeah, one of the things I'm seeing as a trend, and even here at the show, is uh, the ability to buy in cost governance with uh, you know, some of the analytics in terms of determining value. So not only can we predict the value that using this kind of technology, and that's what we're doing, it's just technological value that's right. coming into the enterprise and what that's going to come back to us reassessing the value based on putting a premium on agility and time to market and things like that. But the ability to bind that to an operational cloud tool, which is going to monitor the value that's being delivered. And so we can see the thing operating and we can see how much we're spending on cloud. We can also see the direct value that's coming into it. If we put a certain application into production, a database into production, you know, things like that. So we're, are we going to get to this perfect world where it's all monitorable, and uh, we have the ability to not only predict where the expenses are, but you know, figure out and actually count down the money that's coming back from the use of the technology? Well, I mean, if, if, I, if we come up with that one, then I, this will be my last podcast here, I guess, right? Because I'm going to take that show on the road. But we are 
increasing the level of fidelity and certitude when addressing how value is differentiated and sustained. Because that's the importance, the one-time decision, right, to get the business excited, uh, to create pool for cloud momentum so it doesn't feel as much a CIO or technology push to cloud as the new shiniest object. Um, that one-time event is the first part, but then how do the, you, you continue to sustain? How do you illustrate that value sort of continuum? You, men, you mentioned it, I think, quite nicely. How do, you, how do you monetize the agility that you get and the productivity enhancement long term? That's more than just a transparent sort of data. There's lots of tools in and around cloud that can do that sort of on and off and data and predictability, but now we're talking about a value curve, uh, which is a little more interesting. And so we're trying to create some tools and frameworks that do that. Uh, we have one called Cloud, Cloud Value Calculator, sort of exactly what it is, right, CVC. Uh, that's specific to GCP, for instance, and others, but we're at a GCP conference, so specific to GCP. And that's important to say, it's not only just the cursory sort of compute part of cloud, but as you, you move into the deeper stack that GCP provides, how does that extract potentially deeper value, um, create some sort of centers of excellence within your organization, it's more efficient um, as we move forward. One of the things I've seen over the last couple of years is clients have that one moment, everyone agrees, and then like, you know, it just diffuses into the organization, everyone lose track of it until the bill comes. You're like, what's happening? But I think getting more integration and partnership with the business and the technology function and those two stacks, putting them together, that's where you can actually see more pull, as JT said, and therefore a better handle on what's happening, who's using it, why, what are we launching, and that, that's actually part of the answer too. Yeah. So is, is a cloud value calculator really kind of a useful tool or is it a strategic tool that will have the answer or is it just kind of provides rules of thumb so I can kind of figure out the level of value that I'm probably going to get but not necessarily going to be promised to get? You know, quite frankly, I think it's not the only tool or the only answer. There's no silver bullet. It can't just be economics. It can't just be a, a feeling of value and therefore then go. But I do think it is an important uh, component or module in a bigger story that has uh, you know, how, to, how to predict and drive and attribute the value of a, of a platform centricity, including cloud. Then you can add sort of the data centricity and what that could potentially do. Then you get into other uh, you know, elements that frankly don't have a tool, organizational components and dynamics, throughput and agility, how do you move to DevOps. All of that I think gets and starts to crystallize the why cloud, why now. CVC I think is a good, is a good way to attribute value because at the end of the day there's likely a CFO. At the end of the day, um, you know, particularly for clients that might be empowering utility where capital is king and they get a return on investment, moving to an expense line is, is a, just an entirely different balance sheet conversation. And so whether to do that in a sort of a rapid, is cloud going to pay off diagnostic or an exhaustive, CVC can help drive the foundation of that. But beyond that, it takes a bit of a village, as you know, to get it right. So Andrew, are we, are we trying to model something that's too complex, there's too many moving parts? Is that going to be a, and that's changing all the time? Yeah, well, as you move out from the center, the IT, the things you can measure precisely, and you start to go to people and ops and value, it does get more, uh, sorry, less precise, but more squishy. valuable. Yeah. yeah, it's a little more squishy, so, but the thing is, that's where a lot of the value is. I mean, we, we've got some clients, if you're really sweating your assets, it may not always make sense to just, you know, infrastructure only move that to the cloud. Right, it could be in similar uh, cost position or economics. But once you start adding in the agility, the DevOps, all the things you can do, and particularly the business value, that's where you see it, it's a no-brainer, right? To launch new products, go to new markets, and shut it down when it's not working and redeploy assets and people elsewhere. And, and one, of, one of the things I think Andrew is leading for us and, and others are is, it's not just around the technology stack, sort of in the CIO or CTO's remit, we're seeing the convergence of a of chief digital officer and a CIO, um, either, either cooperating or becoming that same role and that same persona. We're seeing the, the sort of the promise of technology broader than just in the IT stack and across the C-suite. And so um, that, that modeling now has to be what can technology do to the organization, not just what one specific technology can do. So we're evolving, as you know, the CVC to be more of a technology framework to say, you know, technology is not exhaustively and only in a CIO's remit, and so therefore, to unlock that across, we have to be able to attribute a broader definition of technology and then a broader value. And so that's sort of the next phase or the next release, if you will, of that tool's evolution. Yeah, it is, a, it is kind of moving to the thing where we're leveraging technology as a force multiplier for the business. And if you think about 
just the number of startups, and I'm not going to list them here, we know who they are, that leveraged uh, cloud computing as a way to, in essence, disrupt the market. Right, material advantage. Yeah, get into and get the transportation industry and the entertainment industry and things like that. And now we're seeing a thing where actually the Global 2000 companies are in fear of some of this disruption coming along and have to become disruptors for the disruption, or basically dis disrupt the disruptors yes. before they get disrupted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we got this huge, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of disruption. Yeah, a lot of disruption. <laughs> and so the thing is, is what they're looking for is some kind of more innovative way to do something. Whether that's uh, automobile manufacturers leveraging driverless cars and you know, building, uh, you know, building uh, you know, grids for electric vehicles and things like that. And they have to get into kind of a, a very different position of being leaders in the technology space, very much like the startups were. So are we going to get there? Are we, are we going to see a brand apocalypse? We're going to see a lot of companies just kind of go away because they're unable to, in essence, disrupt the disruptors and they're not able to embrace technology for the value technology is bringing. Uh, well, but I would say that the pace of innovation is absolutely accelerating. Uh, if you look at the Fortune 500, the number of companies that were around 100 and some years ago um, or, sorry, on, on the stock market listed independently are now many, many fewer. So the, lifespan of a company is, is shrinking um, you know, every couple of years. So I, I think th the biggest thing is to understand where uh, in the future is my market going to go? Like what, what's the ultimate evolution starting there, anchoring on that, and then driving towards that? Because a lot of the same tools that we have here, that our clients have, they're available to their competitors. So the technology itself isn't necessarily the competitive advantage that it once was. And it's, how you use it and to what end. Yeah, it's all about innovation. You know, speaking of innovation, you know, some of the things, the announcements that occurred here at, uh, at Next, I mean, they, they announced a, uh, a system that's able to move applications in between on-premise systems and cloud-based systems and do so at will. In other words, you can just go ahead and drag things on a screen and move it from one side to another. And so we're changing the game in how we develop and deploy and operate applications. How do we fold that back into a value model? Yeah, the, I mean, the release today of, uh, if I said it right, Athos, right, Athos, is pretty compelling. Um, because the modeling today has been on a static legacy environment with a, with, a, with a general concept that it has to change. And of course it can change hybrid and you can drive CapEx and there's going to be a clever balance, but the modeling has mostly been to cloud. And therefore, uh, if not for cloud, then you can unlock differentiating and so that force multiplier value. Frankly, Athos a bit changes the modeling that we're going to have to do because now it allows in an open source framework, so there's all the modeling around um, software, license management, and, and those type of aspects which have a lot of technical debt, but also the ability to go multi-cloud, which now adds some complexity to the model because there's some nuances in modeling, each of the cloud providers, as you can imagine, in the public clouds. And then the, the propensity of what I would see, I think, where it's going to change the game for some of my clients is they, they if they've driven cost out of their systems through what at the time was very smart transformational levers, they may have uh, consolidated, they might have moved to elastic data center models and colos, they may have sourced those to get that resource unit cost really low. That's a pretty efficient work unit. And so they're, they're saying, listen, I understand the benefits of cloud, but I don't know if I can do that at scale. Maybe I'll do that as a prototype, maybe I'll do that as pockets, where I drive innovation with the business, but at scale, my, my main Fortune 1,500 company that's you know, been built over time, you know, I, I don't see the business case to do that. And so where I think this has changed a bit of the modeling is to be able to apply a layer that allows you to see the things and react to the things today that look more like cloud, and, and then do that in an almost automated, sort of hands-free fashion. Which is going to change the cost curve on the migration, which will therefore change the, the modeling. So, pretty exciting actually today, but we're going to have to, we're going to, have to get the, the smart yeah. piece I, uh, I behind the scenes. Very impactful announcement for sure, but what I thought was interesting just from a strategy perspective was all of the open source and other players that yes. can now sit on that platform. So, as a user, I'm on the platform and I can get this amazing access to the range, which I think will only grow over time. And it's unified, there's one bill, it's actually quite simple to use. And so, instead of a kind of complex, messy ecosystem, I've now got one place to really play and get take advantage of all of those yeah. capabilities in the marketplace, which is, you know, it's a good strategic move for GCP. I, well. I think it is. And so, you know, we want to beat up that. We're talking a little bit about economics and strategy, but 
you know, most of our clients have a multi-cloud strategy, but they have it broadly multi-cloud, but as they're trying to figure out how their talent model extracts the value, they likely don't have the bandwidth and throughput to go deep on both. So what they're generally doing is, is going a little deeper on a prime cloud and have a secondary. So this, unless they maybe have an expensive horizontal integrator like a Pivotal or something like that, what this basically says is you, you can have some sort of broad skills and you can now you know, sort of you know, move at pace between the clouds. And so it, it, it also likely, and we got to think about this, just announced today, right? Changes a bit of where they're driving their talent model, where maybe their DevOps platforms go, because we've had professed that after you pick a cloud, go a little deeper in that to build that competency, get some scale so you're not dabbling. Um, and now you're modeling all of those kind of complex levers. So um, I think great announcement today and um, we're going to have to continue to look into it. Won't that make your job more difficult? The thing is if I'm able to agilely move between systems and therefore I'm trying to calculate the value and we were, in essence to your point, was very profound, we're, we're calculating value of a unidirectional movement. In other words, we're moving to something else, it's a right. re-platforming. Now the platform becomes multiple platforms. And so we're creating something that's able to relocate based on various systems. And even heading down the line, we're getting to this uh, you know, autonomous, intelligent, uh, self-migrating containers. Yes. You know, and, that, that's, uh, and that's actually a paper I wrote for IEEE 10 years ago. And you know, it's going to come true and the robots are going to take over the world and we're 100%. all going to be their slaves. Right. Um, so, I mean, all this stuff is coming down the line where it's going to be a little bit more difficult for you guys to predict what the value was going to be you know, going well, forward. I would, so I would say maybe more difficult to predict uh, or more complex to predict precise value, meaning if I do this or do that. But what's interesting is because of that open source platform, all the other players, it's an ecosystem, the capabilities they have, I think it becomes more of a conversation about business value, right? Again, new offers, new customer experiences, go and um, change your pricing dynamically and do it, you know, every minute, that kind of, that stuff is a, you know, that's like business school type of math, right? We've been doing for a long time, but that becomes much more interesting and impactful uh, for our clients, rather than just the technical sort of go from, you know, what I used to have to cloud. And, and that's where today, actually, I wanted the, the, the plenary to have the next speaker talk about that, right? They, they had an example of how they did it, which I thought was pretty cool, right? They did it on a, a, a competitor's cloud, they containerized it and moved it. There was a website example today in the plenary. I loved it. I wanted the next person to come out that owned that website and say, and here's the business value of that, other than bigger, faster, stronger. I, I, you know, I, and maybe that's because we're coming a bit from the strategy side, where we're having a lot of conversations that are not at the L3s, L4s, L5s, that are into the infrastructure and app stack that want to get technical fast. When you're having a conversation with a CSO, Right, the concept of cloud has to be sort of aggregated up to a level of what it can do and the precision that it can have on that kind of dual horizon. So you know, one of the CEO studies we just uh, did really said the C well, on the CIO's mind, first of all, technology's on their mind more than ever before, so it sort of validated what we already knew to be true, but it also said the duality of having to run a business in Horizon One today with what I have today and then predict what is going to happen to my business on Horizon 2 is tremendously complex because of the things you said, the disruptor and the disrupting. So how? And so, so I'm not Nostradamus, so I'm not going to know exactly what's going to happen, but my ability to react. If I could increase my reaction time to the disruption, so I maybe get disrupted to my left flank or right, but not off the planet, that would be key to me. And technology is the only way I could do that. And so that's a, just an entirely different value conversation. That's not in the bits and bytes and that will do, but you know, that's where we need to eventually go. So, so there's another kind of dynamic here. So in other words, we have this new technology, which everybody thinks is cool, it's open source, so therefore it's cheap, it's on the cloud, you know, therefore we're going to pay for it for drink. The smaller companies, I would tend to see take advantage of that pretty quickly, where the larger companies have a longer adoption curve. So do you think that time to value issue is going to affect them going forward for the Global 300, the people who you know, we typically deal with? It's an interesting question. I think for the startups and the smaller companies, they have to because they don't, they're not sitting on a multi-billion dollar business as a churning out cash flow, right? So they've got a lot of incentive to move to the new, you know, cheaper, better, faster areas. They'll have to do that. Um, I think while the larger companies uh, take the time and migrate, they also get the benefit of looking out over time and seeing how things are going to evolve and leveraging the, the existing business they have to fund that. So I, you know, it's, it's two different sides uh, of that argument. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. 
Yeah, it is. And so, so uh, I'll put you on the spot, JT. So in other words, I'm a you know, Midwestern tire company. I'm, you know, I'm running SAP R3, had a bad migration you know, 20 years ago, spent a lot of money you know, running everything on a mainframe. Uh, probably my IT budget is a uh, you know one percent of uh, the twenty billion dollar annual revenue that I have, and I don't want to go up any further. And I'm looking to make the migration into cloud, and I need to figure out the value of doing so, so I can report this to the board. They say they're a publicly traded company and report it to the street as well. What are the first three steps I need to do to get to that point where I'm able to figure out the value, or can I? Yeah, I mean, so it sounds like uh, there's a lot of companies in our portfolio that are having that problem. So, how do I, I'd skin that cap in a, in a couple ways? That cap in a couple ways. First, I'd frankly start without the modeling with the leadership. So, if they got to that position and that level of technical debt and sort of that pace of play, there's clearly a cultural aspect of that company that likely needs to pivot. You will never convince them with any calculation or attribution that uh, cloud and technology and leaning into the wind without a bit of a cultural shift. So I'd, I would start frankly with the leadership at the technology level and upwards. And so let's assume um, they've made some changes uh, and they want to, and they have sort of a, a bold view of the future, right? So, you know, I'd caveat it there. You know, I would, I would look at, first of all, Midwest company that makes tires um, may or may not be the, uh, the beacon of talent. So there, there's, there's going to be a, a bunch of complex motions with uh, where their run rate is today, as a percentage of spend, an extrapolation of what the business thinks is valuable and where the business wants to go. I'd actually start, uh, David, with a bit of a, a, you know, a monitor Deloitte approach, frankly, which is we call the choice cascade. So a series of choices where technology can fundamentally drive and sit in an opportunity space, a business space, that can create differentiating value. If you could find the four or five spaces for Midwest Tire Company, and then you would quickly get to the, the capabilities, talent, and technology that enables those spaces to thrive at scale, at pace. And what you will have is a clear articulation of the ability of the existing tech stack to achieve that. If you could create that, I haven't even got to the, how much it costs yet. If you could get to that fundamental, what you've created between the business executives is I need that, and that's material, and oh my gosh, I didn't know that technology was so material, and I'm not sure I have the capability to do it. And once you've created that general understanding, the whole script for that technology journey has just changed, because now technology is much farther up in the conversation paradigm, and now everything that flows down on if you can do it, how you can do it, who do you do it with, you move to cloud, how much does it cost, becomes a function of enabling that core opportunity space, or the decision not to do it because it's too big of a lift, but then fundamentally the business knows that it can't pivot on the technology yeah, access. I think that's the thing. So you said, as an example, 1% of a, you know, a billion dollars or something. If you want to keep that business and just do that business, maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe that's, they just sit on what they have, but who's going to say, yeah, we're not going to change. We're going to keep our existing business because the world around them is changing. There's an entire business, which I happen to know, there's digital online selling of tires, there's home delivery. There's a lot of disruption going on. So if they want to exist in five or 10 years, they have to pivot. So the question is not, how do I spend no more than 1% of a number? It's I need to spend 1% of a much bigger number and to get there, I've got to invest. Great answers, guys. Well, thank you very much. JT, John Torty, and uh, Andrew Adams for joining us today and teaching us about the value of cloud computing. Thank you for listening to On Cloud for Cloud Professionals with David Linthicum. Connect with David on Twitter and LinkedIn. And visit the Deloitte On Cloud blog at deloitte.com forward slash US forward slash Deloitte dash on dash cloud dash blog. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. <laughs>